This is Your Pain Game Podcast, where we talk about the game of living in and with chronic pain and trauma, getting to the heart of how to heal. I am your host, Lindsay Soprano. On this show, I plan on discussing with doctors, chronic pain patients, holistic practitioners, loved ones, and anybody that is interested in having their voice heard in the chronic pain and trauma world that we live in. I'm not sure how many of you guys have seen the movie, um, the Scorsese film called The Wolf of Wall Street with Leo DiCaprio, darling, and Jonah Hill, right? If you have, then you know about the story of Jordan Belfort, who was the uh, former stockbroker and financial criminal. (laughs) And what he and his crew lived like in this movie was just insane. I mean, basically, they lived on booze, going to strip clubs and doing so much blow, your mind would spin. (laughs) And not to mention making a ton of money to support those habits, right? How do you live like that without being able to bankroll it, right? To support it. So, and I'm no stranger to addiction, as I've talked about openly and honestly here. Um, I certainly have done my fair share of debauchery and I've put myself into a ton of terrible places in my life and um, I've gotten in trouble in a lot of destructive categories. <laughs> and in some in some places, I am very fortunate that I made it through and that I am alive. So let's all get a round of applause for me on that one, right? <laughs> and as much fun as strip clubs and blow were, I am happy that I turned into the woman that I've become, but it wasn't necessarily all that easy to get here. Especially when you're... <laughs> getting rid of all of these addictions and all of the anxiety and all of the pain and all these things that come up, especially when you don't remember half of what you were doing. So my guest today is going to talk with us a little bit about his shenanigans and debauchery that eventually ended up leading to a nervous breakdown at the age of 29. I mean, he was on suicide watch, guys, and things were pretty dark and dire. So what saved him, right? Well, let's talk about it. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you today to my guest, Tom Cronin. Hello, darling. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along today. Looking forward to this today. Oh, yes, me too. Very much so. So Tom spent 26 years in finance markets. Alas, the wolf thing in the beginning here. Um, He was as one of Australia's leading bond and swap brokers. He hit this crisis point, which we're going to talk about. And when he did, he found meditation. And Tom is the founder of The Stillness Project. And when I first looked into it and was reading about it, I was so nervous because I am not a still person, right? I am wild and crazy and sitting still is very, very scary. Meditation is very scary. And I want today we're going to not make us scared to do it anymore, right? So anyway, so The Stillness Project, he'll talk about it too, but it's a global movement to inspire 1 billion people to sit in stillness daily. Did anybody like get a little squirmy right now just thinking about that? Because for me, I get my, my buns want to sh- shake and shiver a little bit. He, his ongoing work in transformational leadership coaching and corporate training has seen him working with some of the top companies in the world like Amazon, yay Amazon, Harvard Business School, and Coca-Cola amongst many others. He has six books published, a meditation app that he's launched, and he also wrote and produced the documentary, The Portal, which follows six people and a robot who transfer their lives using stillness and mindfulness. And I can't wait to figure out what this robot's all about. (laughs) All right. So I'm rolling out the red carpet for you. I'd like to start by talking about how you were living, you know, and I guess kind of sort of dying at the same time too, like Belfort and DiCaprio. And let's take it from there. Yeah, let's dive into that. So Jordan Belfort, Wolf of Wall Street, he started his career at the age of 22 in 1987. And that was the year that I stumbled into finance markets and It was a bit of a default thing, an accident, really. I was just uh, about to do a degree in journalism. Ironically, I wanted to write articles for Time Magazine, Saving the World from Capitalistic Greed. I'd just been (laughs) backpacking around the world, listening to Susie and the Banshees and the Smiths and reading Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus on a train, traveling through Europe. But I had a few months to fill. Uh, I had no money in my pocket. So I just applied to a bunch of jobs in the paper. That was in the old days before we had internet. And I got accepted for one of these jobs. Had no idea what it was or what I was doing, but it was on this massive trading room floor and they needed some young guns to sort of help out um, as the market was just booming. It was late 80s and markets were kind of crazy back then. And so I just landed this job and next thing I'm on a massive trading room floor was given a six-figure salary, a corporate Amex card and a sporty, uh, sporty uh, fancy sports car and um, told to go out and win business. And so it was really exciting. And what was part of that culture was lots of drinking and drugs, as you'd imagine. It was 
kind of crazy old times and nothing was really regulated or checked. And so kind of anything went and, you know, it was just, you just, before long, all of your morals, all of your guidance systems, your North Star for how you want to live your life and what you want to bring to the world gets blown out the window because there's something in front of you that's so glamorous and glitzy and just pulls you down this sort of, you know, this avenue of just being into that hedonism that was in front of you. And I didn't have the the mindfulness or the consciousness back then to make more discerning decisions about whether this was a good path to take or not. You just go straight into it. So you're there, you're you're doing all of the things. You're doing the wolf, right? You're in your own wolf pack there. And what happened when you, I mean you're doing all of these debaucherous things, which we talked about briefly in the beginning here, just not unlike myself. And mine wasn't because I was on a trade floor, but I did make good money and I had money to support it. And I I loved it. I loved the danger. I loved the scary part of it. I loved drunk dr- drinking and driving. I loved these these terribly uh, just horrible behaviors. It just gave me a high to be that way all the time. And I lived that way hard and I, I crashed and burned pretty hard too. <laughs> so when, what happened to you when you crashed and burned here? Yeah, you know, it was a gradual process. Uh, you know, weekdays was in the finance industry, which was lots of coke and drink and being out till the wee hours of the morning um, with the sort of the market cowboys. And then weekends was a totally different group of people where I was really got deep into, it was late 80s, early 90s and the rave culture was just emerging out of England, which was big warehouse parties and going off into, you know, the, you know, out of the, into rural um, parts of um, Sydney and going to raves out in paddocks and things like that. And so I got really into that sort of world as well. So there was these two kind of crazy worlds of really just getting high as you could and as wild and as out of it as you could. Um, and what started to show up for me was just this gradual emergence of signals within my body that, hey, this isn't really the best thing you could be doing with this vessel, this vehicle. And it would be showing up like insomnia and I started getting anxiety and I started getting you know, big black bags under my eyes and really skinny, really lean and um, that really pasty sort of druggy look. And now you don't know that this is all happening. You kind of, it's just gradually morphing. And, and you know, I look back now and I can see photos of me. It's like, wow, I look like a complete wreck. But you're just a very high functioning wreck and you don't realize yeah, yeah, that yeah. this is happening, Absolutely. right? Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, you're just still doing all the things you're doing, but you just don't realize there's this, this the deterioration of your state of wellness and health and happiness. And of course, you just keep going down that route of more drugs, more drinking, more partying. And then eventually in 1996, this culmination of many years of that escalation of my body really trying to indicate to me that it didn't enjoy what I was doing. Then there was a full-blown nervous breakdown one morning in February 1996. What happened in your nervous breakdown? Because we, we, we say that kind of lightly, you know, oh, I had a nervous breakdown. Well, what does that actually mean to you? Yeah, so what had happened was I was getting these waves of panic. Now, I didn't know what a panic attack was, but I'd get these episodes where I would be, have to race to the cubicle at work and I just couldn't breathe and I couldn't, my vision would blur and I'd have a pain in my heart and all I'd clammy, sweaty palms and, you know, wanted to vomit or, and just have this incredible sense of dread and nausea. They would pass after a while. So, you know, you just go back to keep functioning. But what had happened on this particular morning was the escalation of these episodes where I was actually getting ready for work. And I was in the bathroom and I was, I remember shaving. And then I had this thought in my head that I had this really big lunch that day with a big client. It was some of their senior traders at a large investment bank. And these lunches are like four to six hours. You know, it's like Matthew McConaughey, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you're <laughs> yeah. in these really big, fancy restaurants, long, long lunches, and you're kind of stuck at the table. And I had this thought in my mind, oh, shit, what if one of those episodes come? What if I get stuck at the table? What if I can't get away? What if I, what if I you know, get this one horrible, embarrassing situation? And then what had happened was the fear of the fear became such a tsunami. It was like a tidal wave. and what happened in that moment was I, I couldn't breathe and my vision blurred. My legs collapsed underneath me. It felt like a knife had gone into my heart. I wanted to vomit. I wanted to go to the toilet. And I was just curled up in a ball on the bathroom floor. And I remember just like in this, I, I actually thought I was dying. I thought I was having a, a heart attack. And I, I kind of just was so over life. I was so over who I'd become. I was so far from my moral code and who I wanted to be in life without realizing it, but at this point, just, just so miserable and so fed up with everything that I didn't really care if that was it. And then what happened was um, my partner found me and came and picked me up and took me to the doctor. And you know, we had no idea what was going on. It's like, you know, the things are pretty messed up now. You better get to the doctor. 
And then they explained to me that I was having a nervous breakdown, kind of like pretty much in their words. And, and then I just burst into tears. I remember I couldn't stop crying. It was like an uncontrollable wreck. I'd become almost like I felt like a madman. And it was like the rug that I'd been standing on had been pulled out from underneath me and I just didn't have any solid ground under me and I just completely lost the sense of self or who I was and it was really crushing. At that time, I'd, I'd also had the worst chronic insomnia, uh, waves of these panic attacks and, and really deep depression, a really dark sort of sense of, I guess, misery about life um, that had built and built over time, but it kind of es- escalated on this day and I'd become... I guess in some respects, really questioning whether I want to go on with life, a bit suicidal. And he sent me to a psychiatrist and he put me on pharmaceutical drugs and told me I had to keep going back for these sessions. And that was kind of like the, the Western medicine approach to my healing, uh, which in, we can get to it, but it, 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 it didn't last too long because I felt there was, there was possibly another alternative for me. And that's when I came across meditation. Yeah, because the Western medicine thing, we talk about it all the time here about how we've been let down by some, like I, as soon as you said, of course, they give you big pharma stuff, you know, here, take this. Don't even, don't deal with what's actually happening in your life. Let's just medicate you through it, which is what you were doing in the first place, just with a different type of medicine, right? I mean, I I remember it very, (laughs) like it was yesterday when I was doing these things, like, oh my gosh, I had white counters in my kitchen, I'll never forget. And it was like, cocaine is white. And I'm like, I swear to God, that's got to be another line somewhere on this kitchen counter. <laughs> you know, the things you do. I, my, my best friend at the time, he and I were heavy into it. And we would like go to Home Depot in the morning. Like it's waiting for the store to open because we've been up all night and we're like, we need something to do. And we would, <laughs> we would just, I mean, they're so unhealthy and so crazy, the things that we were doing and still living and thriving and doing the things that normally do. And people would never guess that I was at my big corporate events with my clients and I was in the bathroom, you know, doing blow with a couple of people that I work with. Like it just, I don't understand how I was able to keep maintaining that for as long as I did without it killing me and without me getting caught, for starters. And also that I didn't have a ton of health issues that came from it. I mean, my liver has seen better days, but <laughs> how is your health though? Like your, your organs? Yeah, you know, it, it, exactly like you said, it surprised me how resilient the body was, you know, right. to what I put it through. And <laughs> the one thing with the body is though, as well as it being quite resilient, it also is quite communicative in that it's constantly trying to give us feedback about what it likes and what it doesn't like. And you know things like a hangover is your body saying, I, I don't really like you putting that toxin into this body. And so it's really good at communicating to you, trying to give you cues to adapt and change. But um, my body was, uh, you know, I was actually quite healthy in some respects. You know, I still was working out and I was one of these really high functioning users at that time. And, you know, I played sport and I went to work every day. I never took sick days. And, you know, I was very, and to, the problem with that is though that, it builds and builds and builds until there's a gargantuan crash, and that's what I had. Um, but you know, my health these days, the body is also very malleable and adaptable, so it can turn around and heal quite quickly. And that's one of the things that I do a lot of work with now with people is that you know you're not unless it's like a really debilitating disease or something like that. But the body has quite remarkable adaptive capacity if we give it the attention and the required tools to enable it to adapt and change and evolve and grow and heal, then it can do that really well. Yeah. And I believe I believe in the power of meditation and healing. And I think that the word is very scary to some people because it the first thing we think of is like some you know, Buddhist says, sitting on top of a hill and not talking for 10 hours, you know, it's like, no, we don't need to do that. But it, it, I find that for me, in my meditation for me is being is actually just self-care. And so I created my own little morning routine that I do and I have my sauna and I either I'm listening to guided meditation or I'm listening to music. I'm always putting like oils and creams and who knows what all over my body and massaging certain places in my body and giving myself some gentle love and some care. And if I don't have that in the morning, like for example, yesterday, I did my, my whole day got completely derailed. It screwed up my whole day legitimately because I did not do that thing for me in the morning that was so incredibly important and something that I have put in to my discipline of my day now. And when I miss it, boy, can I tell the difference. It's amazing. But so you got out, but you stayed in finance after you started, after you got healthier. Yeah, I did another 16 years in the same job, in the same career. That's nuts. At the same place? Same place, same company. 
yeah, 26 years wow. in one company. That's unbelievable to put yourself back into a situation that got you where you were with the same people. That's that's pretty amazing for you. It's remarkable, actually, because most people are like, Ugh. like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the good thing was that it, it's a good lesson, and why I do a lot of corporate work now is that we have the capacity to be in the world. And coming back to your day yesterday, when we have a deep transcending meditation that gives us access to. It's like going through a portal. It gives us access to a part of us that's unruffable. It gives us access to a part of us that actually doesn't get disturbed by situations and circumstances. And that you become almost equanimous based upon life circumstances. And so now life is very unstable. It's very uncertain. And it will continue consistently, no matter how deep your spiritual work is, to create or you know, have circumstances that don't meet your expectations. But when you connect to this part of yourself that's deeper and quieter and more stable, it's like the, the tree roots. If the tree is getting buffered and thrown around by the weather and the elements above the surface, the tree roots are still stable and strong. And we all have that within us as a part of us that most people don't really know it's there, that haven't given it any attention, or they don't know how to access it. But when you do these deeper transcending styles of meditation, what happens is you get to connect to a part of you that is unruffable. There's a beautiful Sanskrit word called tatiksha. And being tatiksha means to be unruffled by the circumstances of life. So when I went back into the industry after learning these deep meditation practices and incorporating them on a regular basis, that's twice a day in my life, what happened was I had a greater capacity to be in those situations and circumstances and be more discerning about what actions I take, so not be lured into all the drug taking and the drinking. You know, I could have, actually have a very successful career and be in that environment without all of the shenanigans not because I just refused point blank to not go into them. It's just I didn't feel called to go into them. And yet I could still operate in that job without having that big stress response. And so that's the work that I do with a lot of these companies is say, you don't need to walk out of that job and go and live on a mountain somewhere in a monastery so <laughs> yeah. you don't have stress. You, know, you can be in the world and maintain that job for many years and still not have the stress response. And that's really what we've got to get the world to realize is that it's not the circumstances that are causing the stress response. It's our relationship to the circumstances which determines what type of response we have to that situation. Yeah, that's well said because I we deal with stress here in our household way more than we would like to. In fact, my sweetie was in the hospital last week and um because he thought he was having a heart attack. And um the stress that we're both under that some of it is completely out of our control. It's just we're stuck in a place when in a, in a in a particular position that he's in that it's incredibly stressful. And it came down to the point that I'm like, I have been knocking, gently tapping on your door and then knocking on your door. And now someone's pounding on your door, honey. Like you mentioned earlier about the signals and the, and the, the, how our body communicates with us and starts talking to us and we don't listen. You know, we don't, we ignore that guidance system that's within us, you know, and it's a whisper and now it's a scream, right? And that happened to me too. And so now it's screaming at him and it's like, I mean, I laid into him. I'm like, we are done with this stress. Like, we, this is done. We are completely done because it's not only affecting your health, it's also affecting mine. And it's affecting the, the people that love us around us too. Because we're all... It's a, it's the, the shit rolls down, right? <laughs> and we're all standing on the bottom of the hill and I'm like just covered in poo. And I'm, I've, just, I've had it, you know? And we have to take an active role in making these changes that we need to because our response to the stress is... The, is it's terrible, both physical and emotional, you know, how we respond to that. Because we can't eliminate like, well, I'm just going to quit my job. It's like, like you said, you can go into that same job and into that role just with a different lens, you know, and a different approach and different tools. But if you don't even carry a backpack with you with any tools in it, then, you know, you're just going to be end up in the same damn place again, you know? <laughs> yeah. Whenever we have discomfort, it's always um, something for us to tune into. If ever there's any disease, discord, discomfort, we have to tune in and say there's only two options in this situation. I either change the outside world. So that is stop taking the drugs, stop drinking, stop staying up late, you know, whatever that is that is causing some discomfort. Or if you're in a position and you can't or don't want to change it, so let's just say you don't want to change your job or we don't want to change the external world, we have to change the internal world. Um, so it's one of those two things. If we've got discomfort, it's a cue. Something must adapt and change. Do I change the outside world? Maybe this relationship isn't working out. Maybe this job's not the right place. Maybe I need to change the city I'm living in. Or I change the way I'm having a relationship with this external world. 
And maybe that's where I need to adapt and change the way I'm relating to these things. Yeah, for sure. And I think that in your transition from... Because you stayed in your job, but then you ended up transitioning to becoming... a. How did this transition from finance broker to meditation teacher play its course? Because that's like such an intriguing part about you. (laughs) Yeah. You know, when I had that nervous breakdown, I came across meditation. It was a game change. It was transcendental meditation. So really deep meditation. And it really turned my life around quickly. And so I started to do a lot of research and more advanced programs in meditation, spirituality, Eastern philosophy. And that was a very long-term gradual process. So I continued on for 16 more years. But all along the way, I was going deeper and deeper down that rabbit hole of enlightenment, spirituality, doing a lot more advanced studies and referring a lot of people who were seeing the changes in me to other meditation teachers. And a lot of people kept asking me, how are you doing this? You know, what's, how, what's the secret? And I had a few friends that were meditation teachers. So I was saying, hey, you should go and talk to this guy. You should go and talk to that lady. And eventually I went, this is crazy. I'm referring so many people to all these teachers. I may as well just become one myself <laughs> yeah, and do that exactly. part-time. And so I did that part-time and I would leave the trading room floor at 5, 5.30. And then I would go and start teaching meditation in a, uh, an office that I was subleasing in the city off an atropath who had finished their sessions at 5, 5.30. And then I'd go in there at 6 o'clock and start teaching. And when I started teaching, I just knew that this was something that I was called to do. I had such a strong passion for it. And um, that's when I started to work out a model and a business sort of construct a, construct a business around it and eventually leave finance full time um, to go and become a teacher and a coach and a speaker. That's amazing. I love that. So how, many, how long did that take you? Um, well, it was a build up, but once I sort of determined that this is what I'm going to do, it, I really sort of allowed about 18 months of preparation to get things into place. I'm not that so much of a spontaneous person. I like to sort of plan things out and yeah. know that <laughs> the world is a bit safer for me. So it's almost like I had one mm-hmm. foot, um, on, on one, um, sort of stone and then had another foot on the other stone, but waiting for the other one to be really stable or a lot more stable. It wasn't yeah. easy. Um, it wasn't like it was suddenly a walk in the park and now I'm, you know, a successful meditation teacher. It's, it's a, it wasn't the biggest financial career move um, to go from being in finance as a broker <laughs> to being a meditation teacher it was quite a, a challenge. It's not something that you hear often. No, yeah. that's right. <laughs> I, I, that's why I love you and your story because it's just like so, it's just out there like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But yeah. I love that that you have. Now, can you explain the difference between just like, because we hear meditation and then we hear transcend. you say it. Transcendental. <laughs> Thank you. Transcendental meditation. What is the difference between those two? Yeah, so there's so many different ways you can meditate. You've got chakra cleansing and gratitude and journaling and visualization. So most of those meditations are where we're thinking. And we're in the idea and the awareness that there's an eye that is actually thinking. And so we have this sense of still the construct of my own individual identity that is thinking about things to maybe make my world better. Now, in a transcending meditation, and there's a couple of different words to describe the same technique, which is Vedic meditation or transcendental meditation. So um, I'm a Vedic meditation teacher, um, which is a similar sort of transcending style of meditation. Now, to transcend means to go beyond. So most meditations, you don't go beyond the thinker. You are the thinker in the meditation, doing the meditation. Now, when we transcend, and this is why you'll learn through, if you do this practice, there's nothing to be afraid of because the thing that's afraid is actually your thinker, which is your Uh, ego. Yeah, The ego is afraid of that because it's afraid, well, I don't exist if you transcend. But when we transcend, what we actually find is a sweet peace, the deep serenity. And um, when we transcend, there's a real beautiful, blissful experience that prevails. So the first glimpse of that will qualify you to and, and, and give you a sense of assurance that this is okay. Not only is it okay, it's like freaking awesome. And people come <laughs> out of their meditations going, my gosh, where did I go? That was amazing. So what we transcend is we transcend the thinking mind, the feeling body, that's your emotions, which is what motivates our thinking mind, and the physicality, which is the body that we occupy. And what causes stress in um, most people's lives is the idea that they're separate, they're individual, and they're reacting to life circumstances. And that's the stress that they're experiencing. But when we transcend, the only thing that remains is deep peace. And that's a very powerful state to put 
our physical body into, our physical body drops into a very deep restful state. And that's when all the healing starts to take place. So the meditation didn't actually heal me. The meditation creates an environment that's conducive for your body to heal you. Your body does the healing and your body is remarkable at healing you. And it's something that we can't do whilst we're in the sympathetic nervous system. That's the the stress response. We need to get the body into a deep parasympathetic nervous system state, which is the peace response. And meditation is just one of the most effective tools to get us there, those deep transcending meditations. Well, I'm sitting here going, okay, well, I need you like 20 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm glad I have you now because I've... I'm going to use the word dabble because that's the best word to describe my meditation journey thus far. Because I've been dabbling, I've been reading, I've been doing, and and since we've spoken, I've just been like, whoa, gosh, like I need to, that's why I wanted you to explain it because the difference between that thinking part and the ego part versus this, I just have this like beautiful vision in my head of where I want to end up. And here I am thinking going, okay, this is where my peaceful place is going to be. (laughs) This is what it's going to look like. No, Lindsay, don't. And so that 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 part I know that's hard for me is t- taking those thoughts when I'm starting to kind of feel a little bit peace, more peaceful in my practice of what I'm doing currently. The the thoughts come in and they bombard me, and I'm working really hard on. You're not allowed to be here right now. You know, get the heck out of here. This isn't for you. This isn't your time. This is my time. Whatever. And now that I'm doing it with my sauna. I open the door of my sauna when a thought comes in or somebody and I'm like, you are not invited in here. And then I close my door again. It's like something that I'm doing. But I, I know for me, and I know you mentioned it too, that we both have, we've both dealt with safety issues, right? Um, for, for many different reasons. But for me, I'm a little bit scared that I'm not going to be able to do it right. Or that I'm not going to hit this this peaceful place where I do feel safe that I can go and I can transcend and I can do those things because I'm scared all of the time to maybe find something in there that scares me, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm tearing up, but that's me. Yeah, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's totally fine and it's very normal. <laughs> so we're afraid of finding something there that we don't want to see. And the thing is that what's there is just peace and quiet. Hmm. The things that we don't want to see are actually... <laughs> what's in, that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's that? And what, what's the scary thing is actually the freneticness of our thoughts and the hyperstimulation in our body and the cortisol and adrenaline that's in our body and the negative thoughts that are in our minds. And so we really want to go beyond that. And what you'll find is, and that's why the beautiful thing about this technique is when we give you this beautiful sound to repeat, it's a mantra, You don't have to try to meditate. You don't have to try to open that door and stop the thoughts and say, you're not welcome here because the mind wants to think and the mind is obsessed about thinking and it's obsessed about thinking because the body is obsessed about feeling. Everything that we do is motivated to get some feelings in our body, even if it's sad feelings, angry feelings, scary feelings. That's why we watch, you know, Saw 17 to get us afraid or go on, you know, scary rides at fun parks to get us afraid or to watch The Notebook and make us feel sad or to get a fist pumping hell yeah when we watch Chris Rock on some comedy show. So we love feelings and we've become very addicted to sensations and that's why our world is where we are. We have a very hedonistic society now. And we, we want to liberate ourselves from that constant addiction and go beyond that craving and start to experience a deep blissfulness and a deep joyfulness and deep lovingness that's always inside of us. So if you've got dark stormy clouds in the sky, and they've been there day in, day out, you wouldn't know that behind those clouds and what the clouds are in is blue sky. And it's always there. And that peace and bliss is always within us. It's just that most of us don't know how to clear the clouds. And so what this meditation technique does is it's very effective and efficient at clearing the clouds and revealing what already is within you. So the bliss is already there. The enlightenment is already there. We don't actually get something when we meditate, we actually lose things when we meditate. We lose Ooh, the noise. I like that. Yeah. I and like that a lot. Our world is obsessed about getting things and that's why we have this insatiable appetite to acquire or experience. But what meditation is about stripping away and clearing and clearing, clearing. However, when we clear, we discover and we discover what's already there. And that's when we start to find that deep, sweet peace that is in every one of us. So we don't want to be afraid of what we what we find when we clear. 
we want to be afraid of what we haven't cleared. Because <laughs> that's yes. the stuff. Well, that's that's well said. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of the fear is, and, and you said something earlier, the fear of the fear, right? And uh, it, because it is, it's scary. Like, oh gosh, I've got to open up some of these cobweb, like these closets that've got stuff that I've just stuck down there and they're just going to stay there for as long as I can. But I believe wholeheartedly that a lot of the reason why I'm sick and why I have, I've, I've got this weird, rare disease thing that I'm going to fight it and I'm going to beat it. But I believe wholeheartedly it's a lot about clearing. Like you said, mm-hmm. I, I yeah. don't believe that this is it for me. Not a chance. Give me a break. <laughs> I got too many things I got to get done in this life, you know? Give Absolutely. me a break. So you had mentioned the word efficiency. And so I'd like to talk about that because I think a question that might be in people's minds, it certainly is in mine, is so how long does this take? Right? So I'm, we're working with you, for example, right? I want to work with you. I'm not talking about length of time till when you start feeling better. But when you're doing an actual... Like you're doing a session with somebody, if that's the right terminology for it, what does a session look like to you to, to you and to me? And how long, how long does that take? I'm just curious. I'm like, do I have to devote like three hours a day to you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm already working out my calendar, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the beautiful thing about this is... And why it's probably one of the very widely used practices in the world. It's, it's very efficient in that you get a lot of bang for your buck out of the time you yeah. allocate towards it. And it's very effective. You notice the changes very, very quickly, like within just a few sessions and certainly within a few days. And thirdly, um, it's very enjoyable. It's actually not hard. It's not, oh my God, I've got to try and empty my mind. I've got to focus my mind. This is really <laughs> uncomfortable. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown trying to meditate. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. This doesn't quite work, right? Um, <laughs> so um, it's very efficient. It's very effective and it's very enjoyable. And it's about 15 to 20 minutes for one session. Yeah, very short. Um, and the reason why it's short is because it's, it's quite deep quite quickly and we get stress cleared out. So the focus of this meditation practice isn't, can I get my mind still? Can I get my mind empty? We're not really interested in that as our goal. What we're interested in is, can I de-excite the mind enough to start clearing stresses? And clearing stresses, like renovating a house, is a little bit of activity, a little bit of stimulation. So we can find that a very successful beneficial meditation can actually have been quite an uncomfortable or busy one. It's just that we were releasing a lot of the imbalances that were in the body. And so some meditations, you go really deep and they're like, we call them the noddies. You get this sort of head sort of nodding down. It feels like you're asleep. You're in a deep meditation. And some of them are very sort of busy and maybe even slightly uncomfortable. And they're all really beneficial because our focus here or our, I guess our intention is to help release during the meditation a lot of those anomalies and stresses that have been trapped in the body. So 15, 20 minutes, once ideally in the morning when you wake up, once ideally in the afternoon uh, before dinner time would be ideal to get the optimal experience. Now, a lot of people, when they learn to meditate with me, they're like, oh, and like I was the same. I'm like, dude, seriously, like twice a day, 20 minutes, how the heck am I going to fit that into my day? I and, know, we are ridiculous. Yeah. And I so I started 40 to, minutes for myself. Yeah, imagine that, far God. out. So I did a lot of contemplation around how was I going to navigate this because everything about the course and the information that I'd acquired was so compelling that I knew it was something that I I really wanted to dedicate the time towards it. And so I realized that everything that everyone on the planet is doing right now, whether they're listening to this podcast or going to the gym or cleaning their bathroom floor or going to the tin cannery to put, you know, tin can lids on tin cans, um, was because they want to find fulfillment. You know, every action is motivated to find fulfillment. And yet we're a deeply unfulfilled society and we're a deeply conflicted society and a deeply addicted society and a deeply stressed society. And so I knew that that was the case for me. So I had to reassess my allocation of time because it's really coming down to core values and competing preferences. I always talk with my clients about in every moment we have competing preferences of what you're going to allocate your time towards. And I realized that this was really like putting the horse before the cart. Now, most of the world are going into action to find fulfillment. And what the meditation does was that it enabled me to access an internal fulfillment. And so what happens is over time is that this gives you an inner fulfillment rather than an outer fulfillment. And when we start to sustain and establish an inner fulfillment that is completely independent and free from the need of the outside world. And that's partly scientifically proven because we reduce the cortisol and adrenaline in our bloodstream when we meditate, and we increase the serotonin and oxytocin, the biochemicals of love and bliss and and happiness. 
And so I was starting to produce less cortisol, more oxytocin and serotonin, starting to feel in a joy. And then what we have is a really interesting phenomenon starts to happen. We have action from fulfillment, not action for fulfillment. And action from fulfillment is a very different action, motivated very differently than action for fulfillment. And that's how we see significant changes in people's lives. You just like love bombed on me right now. (laughs) (laughs) I feel totally love bombed because I mean, if anybody that is listening right now thinks that they should not be doing this, then you should probably go to a different show because we all, I mean, we need this. And this is kind of where you started um, your stillness project, right? So can we kind of, can we talk about the stillness project? And then also I want to talk about your film too. Yeah, when I saw the changes that happened to me, which were quite remarkable and very rapid, yeah, uh, I no was kidding. like, why the freaking hell is the world not doing this? Like I was like, a, I was a crazy person in some respects, not crazy mentally, but like, you know, hey, we've got to get this out to the world. Like, we're all this a little is crazy, solve. okay. Yeah, we're all a bit crazy, right? <laughs> Even as meditators. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got very passionate about, okay, this has been around for 7,000 years. It stood the test of time. There's a very good reason why it's still here. And that's because it works. It's efficient, it's effective, and it's effortless and enjoyable. So I need more people to do this. Like I didn't need medication. I didn't need psychiatry. I didn't need psychologists. didn't need doctors. It was just literally my body doing what it does really well, optimizing Mm -hmm. and healing itself and giving my body the quiet rest that it deserves through a simple meditation practice, repeating a sound. And so the stillness project was like, okay, let's see what the world would be like if I got 1 billion people meditating on a daily basis. And that was kind of like the vision. I worked with some consultants and advisors around the brand, the brand name and the vision mission and the mission statement and all that sort of thing. And admittedly, I got very alpha male, ex-broker, Wolf of Wall Street. Come on, we've got to do this. You know, very passionate and very driven. Uh, These days, after starting that 12, uh, I think it's 11 years ago now. Yeah, 11 years. I started in 2012. I'm less attached and less driven. These days, I'm more about what I coach my clients into. Do what you want to do, but do it with joy in your heart. I was a little bit too focused on the outcome, a little bit too driven, doing a lot of things I wasn't enjoying, being advised and mentored by people that were really very goal-oriented. These days, I'm more about process orientation, which is what state you in while you do what you do. And if you get the outcome, that's great. If you don't get the outcome, that's great. But what's more important is what steady win and how can I be a great leader if I don't embody and live and breathe what it is I want my clients or my students to be living and breathing, which is to be in joy, to be in peace. It's not be so goal-oriented and obsessed like most of the world is these days. And our world is so goal-driven and oriented um, and goal-oriented um, that it causes us to do things that aren't necessarily healthy and good in the process. And so these days, I'm much more process driven and process oriented. That's awesome. Because gosh, I I, what number are you at, by the way? (laughs) You've got a billion people. Where are we at right now? (laughs) Well, someone someone asked me on a podcast yesterday, they said, what do you, you know, how, how, how are you going with that? And I said, I'm doing it right now. I'm talking to you. 100%. me Me talking to you, hopefully, maybe if it's not you, maybe it's someone else that says, you know what, uh, I, I think I might start to do this. And I get a lot of people reaching out to me after hearing me on a podcast. And so um, I do it through retreats. Um, I take people in a deep immersion on retreats. Uh, we've got one in Bali coming up next year, which would be great for you, I think. Um, mm-hmm. We do it through weekend workshops. We do it through online programs. We do it through my keynote presentations in organizations. Uh, I do it on podcasts. You know, everything that I do... You know, if I bump into someone at a school function, you know, with my kids, you know, I'll, you know, they ask, what are you doing? I say, I'm a meditation teacher and a speaker and a coach. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And that in itself is a dynamic exchange. So I don't really have an obsession with counting numbers because a lot of it's hard to measure. More, I'm just like, just keep living and breathing it. And over time, that's going to create an impact. Well, I don't know how it can't. I mean, we all need a little bit more enlightenment, you know, on this planet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> my right gosh. Now. And I mean, I, you know, I'm sitting here. Here's Lindsay. I'm like beating myself up because I have been telling myself that I needed to carve out time to start doing this, what we're talking about here today. And I don't know why I'm avoiding. I don't know why. I'm like, today is it better than any other day to get started on the things that I that I want to do that are 
that put me in, at the top of my list instead of at the very bottom of my list. And I say this all the time. I always take care of everybody before I do me. And then I end up sick and ill and tired and sleep deprived and anxious and panicky and sweaty and whatever, whatever I'm going to feel because I feel all of those things, you know? And it's, it's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, A, I'm looking at you, but I'm also looking at your website to the left of me. And so it's in it, your face has been, and your voice and your message has been in my heart since we met. And uh, so <sighs> let's meet in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come to Bali, I'm everyone. coming to Bali. Let's hang out. We've got a beautiful villa for you, amazing pools and massages. I'm in. I'm totally in. Well, and it, 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 this is, I've got like a couple of these things, these retreats, these, some of these people that I've been meeting as guests on this show have legitimately changed my life in some places. And um, in such a short span of time. And I, I don't think that you're opposite of that. I think that this is something that is that our relationship and the relationship with meditation is going to start right now because... Or it really already did start. It's just... I needed to understand a little bit more about what you did and um, finding people like you. You know, you can Google until the cows come home, but until you actually speak authentically with somebody and really get their background and not some woo-woo marketing blah on their website. You know, I'm like, I want the real nitty gritty. I want somebody that's going to hold me accountable. Like all, all of those kinds of things. Not that I'm not somebody that can be held accountable. It's just in a couple of places, I'm, I'm not. And I'm just like, oh, and then I go to sleep and I'm like, well, I go to sleep. I lay in bed and stare at the ceiling for most of the night. But I'm there and I'm just blah, 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 busy brain disorder thinking of all the things that I should have gotten done today. And I didn't have enough time and all these, you know, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so much noise. And you've really brought to light for me, at least, um, how this can help get rid of some of this stuff, you know, which is great because I like your approach in sharing this with us where you're not getting all this stuff. You're getting rid of a bunch of stuff that you need to get out of your body, mm -hmm. which is so amazing because I feel like I have more darn little like worms and squirms inside of my body that I just want out of here. I just feel uncomfortable in my body half of the time. And a lot of that is body dysmorphic stuff that happened because of <clears throat> because of my illness. I lost a ton of weight and I'm like my body's atrophied and I'm real skinny and I don't eat very much. And um and so there's all these things that I'm that I'm this close to turning the table on one of them, you know, and I'm like, but man, I've got like 10 things I've got to do. And this is absolutely has to be one of them, you know, because I know that I'm gonna be able to heal myself with people like yourself in my corner, you know. I mean, that's why I'm doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely. You know, there's there's so much capacity for healing, yeah. and um, yeah. you know, the, it starts with really a lot more calmness. There's a beautiful analogy which we use: the third law of thermodynamics, which states that as de-excitation occurs, order increases, and as excitation occurs, disorder increases. So, if you take a football stadium with a hundred thousand people in it, they can exit that stadium very calmly uh, in ten minutes. But if there's a bomb or a fire or the gunshot that, and there's pandemonium, then there's freneticness, there's disorder and there's chaos and it doesn't go smoothly. And so the body's like that. If we have hyperstimulation, mind and body, then we have more disorder and our world has become hyperstimulated. We're so hyperstimulated. And so we've got to reclaim back that calmness in our ecosystem, which is the body. And firstly, meditation plays an integral role in that. We can really take that to the next level. And that's where the Bali retreats come in, um, is that. We, we take people because you can meditate twice a day and that will bring a lot more calmness to your day, but then you're still going to be in traffic and dealing with kids and partners and things like that. That's just the nature of our life. And I've, you know, I'm married with kids and I know what it's like to run businesses and have teenagers and all sorts of things. Um, so we can definitely recalibrate and reset every day. So that's a retreat. So retreat yourself to that recalibration. And when we want to put that on steroids, we go away from our environment that is hyper-stimulated to very calm, quiet places like the jungles in Bali, rivers flowing through your villa, past your villa and getting daily massages and daily healings and doing lots of meditation, and eating amazing food and being in this really soothing, nourishing, calming, resetting process for your nervous system. That's when we see a lot of the healing take place and those more powerful experiences. Well, I'm looking forward to being, I'm looking forward to being in a story that you can tell to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big testimony. <laughs> and the thing with the trees, if you look at a tree, you know, before a tree grows up into the world, it grows down first. And the reason why it grows down first is it needs a stability in its deep root system. And also it needs to access the nutrients that feed its capacity to grow up. And 
So as humans, we need that as well. We need to have that daily connection to a deeper part of ourselves before we go into the outside world and into dealing with kids and jobs and social media and all the other things that we engage in. So yeah, that's it's an important rebalancing of what is valuable and important in life. And the, the timing could not be any more perfect for our world right now. So, okay, now I want to move on um, to the portal film because I want to know about the robot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd like to hear about the film because I know we're getting close on time here. So, Yeah, sure. So the film is an extension of, I guess, the Stillness Project, which is what mediums can I use to share a message that no matter what your background, no matter what you've been through, you have the ability to alchemize, to transform, to change. And we took six stories, like you said, that have all had crisis and difficult times. They transformed, changed their life because they meditated. Where does the robot come in? The robot comes in because we found an organization that were programming Sophia, a humanoid robot, to be unconditionally loving. And we were contrasting that, or I guess paralleling that to our six stories. Because what had happened was the six stories had been led to a path of crisis because of the conditioning of their environment. Circumstances, situations had influenced them. And that's what we're doing with AI. And we wanted to show that the programmers of our life and the the lives that we're programming, so my children are getting programmed because they're just watching me. They're learning from me. They're observing me. And so they're getting an indoctrination from their social media, from their news, from their school, from their parents, from their friends. And that sets us all up with a program that is an operating system that we just buy into. We don't realize that we've been deeply coded and conditioned that one thing's normal and we just do that, right? And so we showed that if you took a conscious person that had the capacity to program AI to be unconditionally loving, then AI will be unconditionally loving. And so if we can do that with an AI robot, then we can do that with a human as well because we're doing it with humans anyway. But what we're not doing with humans is we're not conditioning or programming them to be unconditionally loving. Just look at the world right now. We can see that we're not unconditionally loving right now. And we can see that we don't know how to be sovereign in our own state. We can see that we are easily influenced by external world noise and circumstances. Yet we don't have to be. We have the capacity to not be that as well. And there's a thing, we don't know what we don't know, but we have the capacity to, to start to evolve and grow and change. But the programmers of the world, which is everyone, um, we need to start changing how we're programming things. Uh, and that can only come from the state of consciousness of the programmer. So that was my motivation in the film and the stillness project was to A, change our state that we're in because then we will start to change as this sort of ripple effect the lives that we touch around us. So I've changed a lot of people's lives in the last 10 years, but that's only because I've changed my life as well. And we become what we are and we teach what we are. Yeah, so it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different than uh, Coke and strippers, eh? <laughs> it's a slightly different world. Yeah, it's so weird. It's, it is. But you so know, that weird. said, I still love music and I still love congregation. I went to Burning Man just a few years ago before COVID, and I was there for seven days in the desert, and I loved Robot Heart. I loved you know District. I love all those experiences, and I didn't do drugs or drinking. I was doing a lot of meditation. Actually, I found the desert really, really beautiful. And I would ride on my bike way out into the remote regions of the player to find peace and solitude and silence. And then from that come into the the craziness and the contrast of Burning Man. And so it doesn't mean you become a monk and you don't enjoy the delights of life. You know, it's just in Greece, we had a retreat in Greece and you know, there was the joy of the villages and the mountains and diving in the ocean. So you actually become more alive and more um, appreciative of the beauty of life because you have greater consciousness and clarity in your mind and senses and nervous system to really delight in it without getting completely whacked out or unconscious. Yeah, that that completely aligns with like, for example, whenever we go over to Italy and we go to Tuscany, for example, I eat and I don't have any stomach discomfort. I am in far less pain. I sleep. (laughs) I'm not worried about anything, but it is really unbelievable. The second you get back and you're at LAX, you're like, oh God, this is the worst, you know? But it does, the the beauty. I mean, I remember the first time I went, I mean, I was bawling. I was crying with the beauty that was around me and I couldn't think of anything negative. How could you? I'm standing in the middle of like 
three trillion sunflowers. Like there's no happier place for me than that particular moment. I have a big picture of me on it. And it's just, it's a, it's a happy place. It's a peaceful place. It's a safe place. I eat, I drink, I can drink red wine over there without feeling gross. Like, I mean, it's, it, it, that that place is so incredibly sacred and special to me, but I know that I start to I started to see things a little bit differently. And then when you come home, you know it's like oh well, all that's gone, great. But I like that we can create our little mini Tuscany wherever we go. Absolutely, we just yeah. have to we just have to do that. Ooh, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't too bad, Lindsay. Yeah, that's really good. Create our like own that. little Tuscany. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it's within you right now. This has been absolutely wonderful, and I know I can talk to you for a good solid two, three more hours. But is there anything that we'd like to leave um, our audience with? Because we've got... Certainly, you're one more person closer to your billion. All right? <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> chipping away. Just chipping away. Chipping away. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, we, we have currently some very challenging times. And I expect not to scare anyone, but I think we've got some more challenging times on the horizon. Things... Um, we're not out of the woods as far as life just being a beautiful, you know, walk through a trillion sunflowers. And what we want to be able to do is find within us a solace, a place, a sanctuary that is always there. It's a place of love. It's a place of peace. It's a place of serenity. And we just have to shift our gaze and attention from the outside world, which is very magnetic right now. There's a lot of things pulling our attention, social media and news and turmoil and chaos and things that the fascination with the abomination But if we just redirect that attention just for a short period of time each day, inward, and this is where the mantra plays a part, it helps us go inward and it has this wonderful quality to lure our attention. And then we connect to that part of us that gives us that sanctuary and that stability and that quietness to then be in the world and less thrown around and discombobulated by circumstances because circumstances can be pretty intense and we don't want to feel that intensity all the time. Otherwise, it's unsustainable. We'll get sick. And we want to be free from that. So just allocate some time each day to finding a method of meditation that will work for you to give you a deep quietness. I love it. I love it so much. I'm like in between about ready to cry and laugh at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Because we do like to leave this show with a message of hope no matter what. So to anybody that's out there that might be hurting and needs some love and some peace go to um, tomcronin.com, T-O-M-C-R-O-N-I-N.com. He's also on social. He's got his Insta and Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, the whole nine yards. Um, So you can find him there. Thank you so much for your time with us today. It's been transcendental. (laughs) Well, thank you for creating the space. You know, it's people that create the space like yourself to enable me to do what I do. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing and um, the wonderful connection we've had today. So thank you. Thank you so much. You are exclusively invited to share this enlightening and transcendental VIP pain journey together. Let's get to the heart of how to heal with you by my side. Do you know someone who might be living in and with chronic pain or is struggling with something in their life? Some of the things that we've talked about today, addiction, pain, sadness, divorce, whatever it is. If you do send them our way here to the Pain Game Podcast or to Tom, we would love to connect with you, hear your heartfelt stories of strength and wisdom and grit and give you as much hope as we possibly can. And I'd love to have my community of listeners hear your stories and help me provide any hope that I possibly can to anybody that listens. Please follow the Pain Game Podcast wherever you digest your podcast content. We will be there. Visit us at paingamepodcast.com and follow us on all the socials. Thanks for listening, my little VIPs. Catch you on the other side.